I know Robert Meyer Burnett would be like, where's my Hoboden Hot Toys action yes, figure? Yes, right. I need to get that one, one six scale. Yes. Where yes. is it? The very interchangeable bright. hands. I need the interchangeable Hoboden head. Yeah. It's, oh, my God. It's so fun. I've been doing like the nerd voice throughout the show. Nice. Simply because w- when you get around this environment, it's just, I, I don't know, it's just my inner yeah, nerd. Like, just, hey, what's going on? You're dressed up in a weird outfit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's almost sort of like, I'm a Cylon Raider and a nerd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like, your best Cylon Raider from the 80s. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore, joined by Anthony Ray Bench. And we are, uh, we uh, just returned from Comic Con, and it was not the same. It was not the same uh, as Comic Cons that I've been to in the past because uh, uh, we lost a dear friend of mine, a dear friend to the. Uh, just the nerd community everywhere, John Schnepp. If you've seen on social media and you've seen, uh, you've read in the nerdosphere, uh, John Schnepp, who it's hard to describe John because he's so creative at so many different things. But John Schnepp was uh, animation director on Venture Brothers and Metalocalypse. Yeah. He created the, created and designed the, he designed the characters from Metalocalypse. Mm-hmm. Was if you look at the episodes that he directed, they were the best ones. He's also the dir- the director of the documentary "The Death of Superman Lives: What Happened." Um, he's an illustrator, comic writer, comic illustrator, um, and just uh, a good dude. A, a good dude, a cr- creative force. He was the host of a show called Collider Heroes, and a uh, friend of mine for twenty five years. Um, Met him at a film festival, the Chicago Underground Film Festival in the 90s, early 90s. Some point, someone, I got to figure out which one it was. It was either 93 or 94, but right around there. And um, John, um, we met at a film festival, this film festival, the Chicago Underground Film Festival, which is a great festival. And I remember there was some event that was bowling with filmmakers. It was like a, it was like a, a way to bond with all the filmmakers. And I met John and he and um, a guy that he was working with made the weirdest short film I saw. When you go to a lot of these festivals, you see a lot of, you see good stuff and you see not so good stuff. Yeah. He made this film called mad science. I'm pretty sure it's, I mean, I don't know if it could be found out there somewhere online, but um, he made this one called Na- mad science starring himself and his, uh, his guy was working with at the time. And it was the, it was sort of like a Batman and Robin, if they were just scientists and it was bizarre, like as, as directed through the lens of Sid and Marty Croft, it was strange. <laughs> I mean, everything John did was, it's weird because he was a filmmaker. He was like a host of this YouTube show and he passed away. Um, it was actually, uh, God, um, just last Friday, we officially got the news as we were going to, he was supposed to be on our panel for the last, last Jedi debate at San Diego comic con. He was supposed to be on the panel. He asked me, he goes, Hey man, I want to be on the panel. And it's like, well, the answer to that question is always yes, if John wants to be on it, because he'll be funny and he'll kind of take over and it'll be weird and he'll show up late, but he'll still be funny. And um, just, you know, from the day I met the guy, he'll always show up. Late. He'll, well, he'll show, <laughs> I don't care. About it. But I mean, you know, he's a guy that I kind of feel like, um, like we were just constantly having the same discussion. It's like we were recording a podcast for 25 years. So the next time I would see him, we'd sort of pick up the next thing. Um, and we'd start talking about, I don't know, whatever the last thing we were talking about, we were talking about like Jack Kirby and weird stuff that Jack Kirby did. Like we were both fans of a Jack Kirby comic called machine man which uh, not a lot of people know about Machine Man. It was in that weird Marvel era where it's just like, whatever, let's see what sticks to the wall. 
And I still have like all the comics of Machine. And I didn't think anyone even remembered Machine Man. So when John and I would talk about stuff, it would be like first appearance of Silver Surfer in the Fantastic Four, issue 49. And I'm actually not sure if it's issue 49, but if John were here, he would correct me. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, it was like we were just having this ongoing nerd discussion. But the interesting thing was that all of our discussions just it was just a, a continuation of the last one. Um, and it's weird because we never actually other than appearing on, you know, he'd have me on a couple episodes of yeah, on, of Collider Heroes. And I would just do it because he asked me to do it. I have no aspirations to host or be anything on YouTube. Um, I don't want to do that. I'm done doing that kind of stuff. But John, if John asked, I would just do it. So um, I, it was just, it's one of those things where it's like the camera stopped, but we're talking for another hour. We needed to go to lunch after to continue our discussion for the next hour. And I remember it was weird. Like, and then also, like, it's just one of those things where you become friends because you see the same people you enjoy talking to. And I remember this had to be like in the late 90s, early 2000s, where John needed a ride back from Comic-Con one year. And I'm like, I got my car. This is when it wasn't a big deal to go to Comic-Con. When you can buy badges on site. When you could buy badges or just get a badge because you had a business card, right? That, <laughs> no, I wait for a nerd blog. Oh, that was another... Oh. I mean, I've been, I've, we've been having this conversation about John um, last Friday. Um, it, it, there was a posting on his social media uh, from his fiance, Holly Payne. It was on Friday, July twentieth, when she finally announced that he passed away. He um, had it was just a series of health problems, and he, you know. Uh, I just deteriorated quickly. It's one of those things where he thought it was okay, but when he went in the hospital, it was much more serious and he deteriorated. And I went the Tuesday before Comic-Con, the night before I left, I went to the hospital because his fiance said, you need to come say goodbye. I didn't realize how serious it was until I heard from uh, some other people who had gone to see him saying, you have to go. Um, so this this episode of the Film Threat Podcast is a, a tribute to John. He appeared on the podcast five times, at least that we could figure out. Sometimes as yeah. a, well, a bunch of different episodes, but sometimes just like in passing, right? Yeah, well, um, literally in passing. Literally in passing in yeah. one episode. But this this episode is a series of highlights so you could understand who John was, Um how he was so knowledgeable with comics. Um, one of the few people could have that conversation where um, we would just sort of out knowledge each other, but man, he just knew all the deep cuts. He knew all the deep cuts. It, it was just the best from illustrator to illustrator, writer teams to just um, obscure comics we, I mean, one episode, one episode we did of Collider Heroes, we were talking about obscure comics we'd like to see made into movies, you know? Um, that was an amazing discussion. It's an amazing discussion because I, I, actually, I actually felt like I impressed him because there was something that, a comic that he didn't know about, which was fun. Do you remember what that was? Or It was, I remember, I remember exactly, it was Strike Force Muraturi, which is a weird Marvel comic from the eighties that if I told you the story, you'd think it was amazing. Um, that at some point Marvel should make that. Hmm. It could be a standalone something. Uh, but, but I don't know, John, he was, here's the thing I love about John is that he would, you know, I know some people in the nerd space that consider themselves to be celebrities they might be people who just appear on, they just appear on a show on YouTube or whatever. Or they, whatever, but like that, it, John never played that game. He didn't give a shit. You started talking to him about Doctor Strange, Steve Ditko, Doctor Strange. He would stop and talk to you. It didn't matter, you know. He just had the the like. Um, 
he had that spirit of just you know the collective nerddom, right? Yeah. One of my favorite memories of of John, like I, I didn't know him as well as you did. Um, I booked him on a, an old show that I used to produce called Comics on Comics, which I say old, but it came back, so now it's kind of current. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, my, one of my favorite memories was when we went to go see Logan, and we walked out, and I pointed, and I was like, oh, hey, there's Schnupp, and we went over there. We had this conversation, mm-hmm. and, and Holly was there, and she was getting, you know, kind of like, all right, guys, we have so much to do, like, we have, <laughs> you know, this show we're working on tomorrow, and he, he just sat out there and talked to us about everything and, and just, you know, it was just, it, it was a lot of times when you're dealing with, you know, nerdy people, it, it's almost kind of like a contest, like, oh, I know more than you. Um, actually, you're wrong. Right, you know, right. That sort of thing. Schnepp wasn't about that. Schnepp was just a good dude. Like, well, I, he, I can't say that enough. Well, he never, he never would make, he didn't make anybody wrong with his trying to mm-hmm. one upsmanship. It was all about like a shared enthusiasm and knowledge. At least yeah. that's what I felt in our conversations because I know, you know, he, every time that we worked on something, it was always like, like did a show or one of these podcasts or things and always be like, all right, well, let's go out because we weren't done. I kind of yeah. feel like we were never done. It was like this conversation that was ongoing and never ending. And I know that like when he was at things at Phoenix comic con, um, uh, which in one of the episodes we actually drove, we recorded a podcast driving to Phoenix Comic Con, um, and, and and we'll be sharing clips from that here in a yeah. bit. Yeah, uh, but 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 it's it's one of those things where it's just like you you it's like this cool thing you got to tell someone about, and you're like, oh, you know about that cool thing? Whoa! We're like, it's so cool. Like like we would see like certain cosplay that only he and I would know. Be like, whoa! Or, it's like, uh, did you see that Zardoz cosplay? Whoa! Like, it was just like, I guess because we were around the same age, he's a year younger than me. We had the same points of reference. So pop culturally speaking, we kind of grew up, you know, consuming media in the same way and also watch technology evolve to the point where it's like, oh, wow, we can make movies now. Like, we can make movies and we don't need a movie studio to green light our movie. We can just decide to make a movie, you know? Um, so, I mean, that's what was cool about Schnapp. It was just like, he had that spirit of just like, I'm not waiting around and I'm just going to do it. And, and even like in the early 2000s when Film Threat was putting out movies on, on, um, on DVD, he, we put out a couple of his movies um, on DVD. So, and they were freaking weird. Um, they were just bizarre. Uh, I would expect nothing less. Uh, but it was just one of those, he had that indie film spirit, but wasn't sort of indie film subjects. His stuff was very pop culture strange. And um, I just encourage you to, uh, well, I hope you listen to the clips that we have to share with you of John on this episode. We want this to be a tribute to him. And um, and and I hope you'll you know seek out these other episodes that, that John appeared on. He just, you can, you can, he oozes enthusiasm for all all things nerdy, but that, but also just God, you know, you'd see, we'd, we'd, we'd be hanging out at one, you know, whatever Phoenix comic con, San Diego comic con. We were at some comic con in Florida. Um, and we were, yeah, we were at this, what was it? Super con. And we did, I think we did a couple panels together. If I recall correctly, we did a panel about, I don't know. We did a Star Wars panel. We did a panel called Geeks of a Certain Age um, that I believe was recorded and released as a podcast on a... So we've done a lot of podcasts together. He's been on five episodes of the Film Star podcast, but we've also appeared on Comics on Comics. We've appeared on Geeks of a Certain Age. So um, I guess our IMDB, we would be connected if there was an IMDPB, the internet... (laughs) podcast data but there isn't that a thing sounds like a nightmare project yeah that would be terrible Ugh. if someone would were to do that but see if i was talking about it and he was here right now and he heard that he'd think that was a cool nerdy idea and someone and and someone should do it and he was always just like what i also loved about him too is he would shut down any sort of bullshit if he ever heard like friends like shit talking other friends he was just like you know like he he 
I don't know. I was going through some relationship turmoil at one time. Turmoil. This is years ago, and he gave me just the best advice I ever heard. Really gave me the strength to, you know, make the right decision about uh, how to deal with that relationship. And and um, John was just a great person, and I love him and miss him, and and um, you know, glad that I knew him. There's no one I know like him, and. When you get to my age, in my nerd voice now, I mean, you'll hear, like, when you hear some of these clips, you'll hear that both John and I, as soon as the one of us does it, the other one starts doing it. I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Well, you know, yep. I've seen this in person, people. Uh, yes, well, yeah. uh, the Logan's Run comic that Marvel put out only covers the first, uh, the first six issues of that comic, uh, follow the movie, then it goes off into, whatever, um... But yeah, as soon as one of us starts doing the nerd voice, then the other one would do the nerd voice. Yeah. Um, but uh, right now, um, how, if you go to at John Schnepp on Twitter, um, you'll see pinned to the top of the page is a GoFundMe. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll read the GoFundMe. But you know what? You're listening to this. You're probably on your device or you have a device that you're listening through it, just go to at John Schnepp on Twitter, Holly K. Payne, his love of his life, um, producer, and... and um, Partner. Partner, yeah, in all things. Um, she has pinned to the top of the page the GoFundMe and a way to help contribute. Um, she is going to be dealing with a lot over the next year and years of, you know... I just I can't even imagine what that's like. So um we dedicate this issue to John issue. When I say issue, <laughs> you what know am what? I still putting out Film Threat magazine? We'll go I don't know. I'm uh, look, I it does look. Uh Anthony and I are both a little punch drunk and exhausted from Comic Con and Comic Con had a cloud over it. Yeah. Yeah, it there definitely was, did. There was a cloud over Comic Con because of the passing of John Schnepp. So um it affected Everyone, yeah. Kevin Smith did a, a beautiful tribute. I don't know if you saw. I heard about it, that you know? in Hall H. What did he say? Yeah. I didn't hear it. Um, he basically just uh, mentioned um, John and mentioned the, the TV series that uh, John and Holly were working on. That kind of takes the the premise of uh, of the death of Superman uh, lives what happened. Kind of does it to other movies that were in production and for yeah. whatever reason never happened. And uh, he basically he mentioned the GoFundMe. And uh, he said, you know, we're going to make this show happen. Like, you know, we're, he said something about, you know, there's, there's more schnapp for us to share. And, and I thought it was a really cool tribute. He did the moment of silence, mm. which was, was really nice. So props to you, Kevin. Well, and uh, that's, that's, and we, well, we really, we have more schnapp to share. Yeah. So let's share, let's share these clips. For people who do not know who you are, John Schnepp, you've had this amazing career from, I mean, working for MTV, doing graphics as a director, uh, you know, working at Titmouse on on Adventure Brothers, on Metalocalypse, and whenever I saw your name came up as director, you, your episodes of Metalocalypse were always the best episodes. Oh, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. You know, Metalocalypse was like a real fun project to work on. I, I did uh, did eight years of, of my life was devoted to making Metalocalypse, not only the directing the episodes and producing all of the episodes and overseeing everything, also doing all of the music videos for the concert world tour that Brendan went on. I did, I'd say it probably about 80% of all the music videos I directed and edited and uh, it was a lot of fun uh, the world of metal was so much fun to be a part of <laughs> but like I remember I, God, there was an episode that you directed that made my kids cry it was death kids it was death kids when the little you killed me when the little girl died at the end the little girl died at the end and i remember that that just like was incredibly upsetting to my ch first of all how irresponsible am i as a father to let my kids watch this little cartoon show They're but awesome. 
Chris, you, you taught your kids about death, and just that end sequence was so amazing because it was like came out of nowhere. I worked on that sound design of like the you kill. No, no, it was like, I'm dead because of you. Of you. Yeah, but there's like her voice backwards at different tones. It's like it was a lot of work, and I loved I loved like people walking by the office like, what the fuck are you working on? It's like oh oh, they're like giving people nightmares even before it came out. But it's weird because the show. I I just know that you you definitely have a creative stamp where uh, it, it's you could do this the traditional way but there'll always be something that kind of comes out of left field like like a just what the fuck like why did you do that whether it's use of sound or imagery especially on uh, Metalocalypse when they would go to like music video when it would be a music video kind of within the show there's just visual imagery that just was bizarre and I think that was one of the cool things about the show obviously you're not limited you know budget wise it's not like you have a crowd but there's like you can like you can think of anything some of the ridiculous crazy stuff that happened in the show I mean if you can draw it it's it's you could you could if you can think it you can draw it you can send the show yeah, you know, I, I remember my, uh, I think it was the second episode of uh, Metalocalypse, like, I had been uh, doing, working on Space Ghost, and I'd done a couple of Aqua Teens, so I was, like, in the Adult Swim uh, landscape, and having that, had that freedom to just do weird stuff, I remember uh, there was a death sequence where this character who ended up coming back, he died in the episode, but then I kind of brought him back at the very end by doing a graphic saying, he didn't die, he just got robot <laughs> eyes. So then I also inserted him into like an episode, I think it was the death comedy episode, he's in the courtroom kind of <laughs> laughing. And so we actually ended up bringing him actually back from the dead and he became their record producer, but his name was Nubbler. And I came up with this whole sequence where it's like, instead of him just dying and his eyes exploding, let's make it like a minute and a half slow push of him screaming. And I remember it was like, uh, even Brendan and Tommy were like, oh, it's too long. And it was like, the, that it was that long was what made it funny for me. So I think we cut out like 30 seconds. So now it's like, I think it's one minute of him just, ah, like a real slow push towards him and his eyes explode. So, so that kind of having that freedom to be able to try really weird forms of humor was like what is so exciting about really doing anything in the adult world of animation. Metalocalypse. Well, I have a very specific, weird question related to Metalocalypse sure. that I just, I have to ask. Okay, so whenever you would introduce these sort of new characters, and there'd be like a dossier about them, or there'd be some sort of new person they would bring in. You, I, It's not like, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this, the best way to phrase it. The people were just weird looking. I, I guess the best way to describe it is they look like a yearbook from the 50s and like a teacher from the 50s in terms of what they look like physically like they don't make humans like that anymore like like what what i mean is is that you look at these people and it's like where was the f reference to draw the people's faces who looked so unusual and the only thing i could think is this is like this is like from a bygone era or something it's like you used photo reference of people out of like just old just i, I don't know like where did you draw people that look so freaking weird and I'm not saying that they're, they're gross I'm saying just weird looking people well that those kudos go to uh, a good friend of mine Sungu Kwan who was the character designer like I designed the actual band Death Clock and a few of the other the other characters like uh, Ravenswood and a couple of other characters but once uh, we got into production I brought him in A because he could draw way better than me and it was like I really wanted the series to have this look that was not like the rest of Adult Swim I wanted it to have what I used to tell Brendan and Tommy is like hey remember those old Flash Gordon cartoons or Tarzan that were like rotoscoped and kind of all the characters had realistic anatomy that's what I wanted the show to look like so they, you know, they were totally cool with that and were like, yeah, let's do it that way. And so I made sure to bring in someone who can actually draw those kinds of really great characters that looked realistic but also disturbing as fuck. And, like, Goo had this ability to go online and look at different faces. And, you know, that's the greatest thing about being able to make this series and have instant access to, like, a billion weird-looking normal people. And he would just, like, draw, like, seven or eight just kind of strange-looking people. And then Brendan and Tommy would usually be like, mm, that one or this one. I, you know, to me, it was like, it was a grab bag of awesomeness. Like, when it was like, gentlemen, this week some scribby scrab is going to be explaining <laughs> the exposition scene that we are describing to you now there's like a myth the tribunal show was always like exposition alley is what I call it, it was like a re we only have 11 minutes let's re-explain the fucking plot again you know so we would try to have fun even though we were like kind of using that one minute to like 
retell the plot but advance one other storyline because when you have 11 minutes you don't really have an act one act two act three you have your uh, intro and then you're kind of like racing to the end which was usually a concert involving death so it's like <laughs> some kind of cool fucking music video freak out concert sequence so it was kind of like that was the fun part we're like let's set up this you know hippie bojangles or whatever whatever character it was was you know it's like so the weirder they looked the more satisfying okay so i was correct in my assumption that basically you 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 really went after weird looking people yeah. Okay, good. That wasn't like someone... I'm thinking, like, why was there such... Because you could have just drawn generic people, yeah. but they were not that way at all. They were always just strange. So that's cool. So the photo reference was actually, like, real... So someone on that show, it's like, that was them. Well, I mean, uh, Goo is so talented. I mean, he would, like, hybridize. Like, he would be like... Well, he looked at these four different weird-looking people and then come up with a unique, brand-new weird-looking person. Um, and, and we were all lucky enough... Whoa, wait, watch it, Cody. We're all, we're all lucky enough to uh, be on the, be drawn into the show. Like, I'm, I'm in the show three times because I was selfish. And as a director, I was like, I want to die again. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, I know Brennan and Tommy were always like, we don't want the, you know, the, the crew to be drawn in. So we would, like, secretly draw other crew members <laughs> in. And they would never notice it because especially Brennan never knew anybody who worked on the show. He would just, like, come in. So, like, he didn't know anybody, any of the main people's names who actually animated on the show. So if they showed up in the show, he wouldn't notice it. So it was kind of fun, like, to, to squeeze people like you know, here's the character designer or here's you know here are the, the 10 flash animators all dying on this ferris wheel or so there's all these kinds of like cool ways to you know like give people little fun cameo deaths and there was never a big issue about it i i swear you worked me into an episode there's a guy that was like it was like a tv host or something who had weird hair um i think it was like it could have it could have been like a hybrid version of you and one of the producers whose name was Keith Fay. He used to do the Death Clock Minute, uh -huh. and it oh, looked it looked like yes. him, it looked like Keith Fay. It was designed like him. And then Brennan and Tommy wanted to kill him, but we were like, you know what? Let's just burn him really horribly. So he, <laughs> when he comes back in the next <laughs> season, uh, he was just completely scarred, like a melted face. F favorite line from a uh, Metalocalypse episode, which I own all the DVDs, is the one where Nathan Explosion has the girlfriend, the really overbearing girlfriend, and they tell him, like, you got to break up with her. And, and he says, but what if she won't let me? Wow. Awesome. Yeah, no, there's some amazing, amazing lines in that series. And here's some clips from the live show that was recorded, the live uh, film threat that was recorded from Phoenix Comic Con. Welcome to the stage. Oh. Yeah. We have a chair from, waiting for you. From Collider Heroes. Looks like there's still hope Doing, for my dad coming. This in. is like the what if episode of Collider Heroes. Like, I have, I have a couple of what ifs in here. Oh, nice. Woo! Joining the stage, John Schnepp, everyone. <laughs> you also know him as the guy who spoke the truth in Morgan Spurlock's movie about San Diego Comic Con and fandom. Uh, right. I love that. Thanks, Chris. Well, I'm, just hey. trying, I'm trying to build you up and give you a big Boo! <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I get a picture for everybody? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweet this out and say, "Fuck you, Jeremy Johns." Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy's a good pal. So. Everybody, right, get in, one, John, two, get in, John. Show. Hey. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So we were just talking. We were just suddenly leaned in as if they were sure that's where the edge of the frame was. Some people would be like, "I'll lean in and chin. It'll be great. I'll be in." <laughs> so what we were talking, we were basically catching up everyone on movie news that happened in the last week. Now we're going to segue into talking about, I'm at, let's say, like I worked at a video store, and I'm sure a lot of people at, at some point worked in some, if you didn't work at a video store at some point, you went into a video store and you had conversations about what you should see on video. So what I want to ask everyone here on our panel is a movie that you would recommend if video stores existed which they don't. Uh, but if you were going to say the virtual video store now, which I guess is iTunes or Vudu, or buying uh, you know bootleg DVDs on the floor here at the con, because uh, I did see the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie at the con, so I highly recommend picking that up. Why are you talking like a robot? Because because. <laughs> 
I only talk about a ro- I only talk like a robot when I'm around John Schnepp. I don't know why. I think this is this is Chris Gore's nerd voice. <laughs> it's that, that's just because that's our shorthand of like how we've talked to each other for years. But what, right. I, what I want everyone on the panel to do is like give a recommendation for people here. I mean, the, the one thing that people always ask me uh, all the time is they ask me for a movie recommendation. John, you, you probably have a ton in your head. Of, I got of, two. Um, how many people here have seen uh, Stuart Gordon's From Beyond? Hmm? All right, speckling. So anyway, Stuart Gordon made a bunch of these really cool movies. He made Reanimator, made From Beyond. He worked with a guy named Brian Yuzna, so I would recommend Society, which is a very, very strange, very special effects, uh, heavy freaky look at really rich, gross people and why you'd want to see them all murdered. Um, I'd highly recommend seeing it. It's called Society. It just They recently re-released it on a Blu-ray and DVD, so I would say that, or I would go older school, I'd say John Borman's Zardoz. Uh, how many people yeah. here have seen Zardoz? Oh. Zardoz! The penis is evil! Not really, <laughs> but when you see the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. You should definitely see this movie. It's like the perfect 70s film, loaded with sex and fucking violence and awesomeness, and an actual real message. And when you find out what Zardoz really means, your mind will be blown. <laughs> I'm not I can't gonna... wait. No spoilers! This is John Schnepp on uh, the Film Threat Podcast live from 2017. Uh, San Diego Comic Con. Uh, here's a clip from that live show. I love those kind of small indie movies. John, do you have one that you would recommend to people? You probably have 50 yeah. off the top of your head. I was just thinking about Meet the Hollowheads, 1989. Just IMD beat it because I couldn't remember all the different. There's so many. Juliet Lewis is the main star of it. It's a super weird film. I can't even remember. Director Thomas R. Berman. It's got the the throw mama from the train lady. She plays like this creepy, evil garbage lady. All right. Um, It's fucking weird. I just remember like, uh, it's like, it's set in some kind of a horrible future where everyone's like kind of using like very cheap Brazil style tubing and like it's kind of got a little bit of a Jetsons flavor to it. Nice. Um, Really fun, very bizarre, off the beaten track. I was going to say a bunch of ones that aren't really obscure anymore, like Zardoz or Videodrome. Those have kind of come around from obscurity, and now all the nerds are like, those are my favorite films, which is good. <laughs> those should be your favorite films. But that's a weirdo one uh, that uh, actually Holly turned me on to. I'd never even heard of it. She was well, like, you got to see Meet the Hollowheads. Resident Evil was a guilty pleasure for me. Uh, I mean, I know it's none of them are great films, but they're all they were all fun. I was like, I never... I'm not one of those people who's like, gonna just check my brain at the door. But for myself, it was like I knew what I was paying for. I'm gonna go pay for like, I know exactly what I'm getting and I wasn't expecting a storyline. I, I, I wonder why I just didn't get that Oscar nomination this year. I didn't <laughs> yeah. ever, like that was never. <laughs> a tough, so cr- crowded year. There's like, a, especially if you're a genre fan, there's like, you have to put movies in categories and there's like mm. specific movies like Moon, which go in one specific category and Resident Evil, which go in a very completely different world. Mm-hmm. And then you have all the super low budget, like Z grade, almost what you would call psychotronic films, which you can't gauge or judge against all these other movies. So I feel like at least for myself I categorize films and then I judge them so I was like oh for like a shitty $100 budget film this was amazing you know what I mean so it's like but comparatively to all these other uh, you know the actors the the caliber that you're allowed to have when you can actually rent out studios and make effects and have an editor and a musical score those things change and affect you know the entire production line so I mean for myself would I want to see another sequel to Resident Evil? Well, it was the final chapter. So no, I don't want to see any more with Mia, but I would say, just like you were saying, Resident Evil and Silent Hill are great, scary, spooky, yes, atmospheric man. video games. I think they could do something with that. So at 2017's LA Comic Con, or whatever the fuck they're calling it now. Well, it's Los Angeles, <laughs> Stan Lee's Los Angeles Comic Con. It's Los no, Angeles Comic Con. I think they dropped the Stan Lee part yeah, now, yeah. so now it's just LA Comic Con. I, I don't know whatever yeah. the fuck well, it we is. We were talking about, we were yeah. talking about Thor Ragnarok, Yeah, and we're just sitting there, and we're recording our thoughts, you know, from live from the con, right? And Schnepp, like, walks by, and I just dragged him into the conversation because uh, we all had just seen it. And then and then we got into this uh, great discussion. One, hands down, one of my favorite uh, moments on on our podcast. It was yeah. just the spontaneity, the stuff that Schnepp was saying. Like, it just, yeah. Um, anyways, here it is. Yeah. Oh, my God. And there's John Schnepp. Schnepp. Hey. We're at, we're doing a... We're doing. We're here. Here's Schnepp right now. He's gonna. He's gonna crash the podcast at this moment. Cool. But I never in my wildest dreams as a kid did I think that I would be seeing these characters 
you know, on screen. We're just we're talking about Thor Ragnarok. I saw I saw your I saw your post about it. Do you want to say anything on the on, on the Film Threat podcast? This is you've been on. Hey, what's going on, man? Yeah. It's fucking awesome. I love Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. Wasn't it great? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I loved it. Wait, everyone's like, Every, you know, everyone describes this as a lot of fun. Come on, stop saying it's fun. Stop saying it's fun. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Is like, you don't use the word fun for a movie that's a lot of fun. Fuck you. How about that? <laughs> Um, I think it's great. It's entertaining. Chris Hemsworth is an incredible comedian that no one... And here's the weird thing is like, I would say you can't really watch Thor and then Thor Dark World and Thor Ragnarok. It's not the completion of a trilogy. No, it's not that, like... It's yeah. not talking about that. We like, were just the tone that. is very yeah. different. Okay. Yeah. Hey guys, I didn't hear them talking about this, but <laughs> you know what? They're totally right because you know what it is? I, and I would like to see a Thor 4 with this tone. Because, like, you know, I think the first two Thors are great. And I love Thor. I love the Walt Simonson run. I like the fucking Lee Kirby run. So I'm like, and there's a lot of other runs in between. So I think they were able to take and pick and little have little moments from all of those. But that's also Taika's sensibility, his sense of humor. Um, you know, if, you, if it's not like it's like you have to have seen the Wilder people to understand this movie. It's, like, it's yeah. not like, you know, if you don't like Taika's other movies, that doesn't mean that you're not going to like Thor Ragnarok, but it's like if you don't have a sense of humor, you might want to skip Thor Ragnarok because it's you're just not going to get it. You're like, I need Thor to be here. Isn't Ragnarok supposed to be dark and about the apocalypse? Then this isn't for you. You need to go go to school, learn about humor, learn about the tra comedy <laughs> tragedy shit that's been going around for thousands of years. Once you grow a pair, then come back and see the fucking movie. You know what I'm saying? It's like yep. be a real human being and understand that there's different ways to tell stories. I mean, look, look, that's for me. And if somebody really hated it because it's too funny, I get where they're coming from. But I thought it was fantastic, and it had just enough humor for me that it didn't. It wasn't like people are like, well, it's like a comedy. I'm like, it's an action comedy. I'm not going to say it's a comedy with action. It's definitely an action film with a lot of comedy in there, and it, all of it was uh, came from the characters. Yeah, it wasn't. They weren't telling jokes. It was all from situations, like a situation comedy. That was one well, of the yeah. criticisms I saw early on about the film, where it was just like, yeah, there's these these, uh, I, I guess, dramatic moments that are it, it's just it's ruined by the comedy. I don't think that's the case at all. I think the comedy was perfect. And I will say this: why it's like it, it's eighty-five percent for me as far as I got of a hundred, just because there were a few dramatic moments that were like undercut because of the comedy. Like, and I'm not going to get yeah. into spoilers, mm -hmm. but you'll know what I'm talking about when you see it. And you're like, they could have, they could have pulled his ass back a little bit. Like, you know, Tiger, how about you don't say that when that happens? So see, for me. It was a little bit too much where I was like, I loved like all of it except yeah. for a few moments where that's for me where I was like, they kind of, if you let that moment be yeah. and then have something happen and then have that same joke, it would have, for me, 100% worked better. I think we're talking about the same moments. And, yes, and, again, and I'm no not spoilers. spoiling yeah, shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think those were hurt more by feeling rushed. Like the, those moments felt rushed. <clears throat> right. And so, you the, know, the hey, humor it's a does giant kind of, movie. Yeah, it's yeah. a giant movie. A lot of shit happens. Mm -hmm. Like it's just so much story crammed into it yeah but i was incredibly happy with surter and oh, that yeah. whole storyline oh my gosh and the way they handled it which i was like i don't know how they're gonna cram planet hulk and ragnarok into one movie and have all this other shit yeah like with hella and all this other and i think they did a fantastic job and i think i for myself hella is an amazing villain and like they're like all oh, the the marvel curse of having shitty villains I think it's not there with this film. I think she's a great villain. I agree. You know, I mean... Uh, we were talking about how the first 15 minutes, they wrap up everything from Thor 1 and 2. Oh, yeah. Kind of in the first 15 minutes and on to the next, on to the next thing. And the other thing that I did love, too, and I know you're a huge fan of this movie... Flash Gordon, oh, the yeah. Flash Gordon influences that, like where they're so so they're like in an elevator having a conversation, yeah. or they're like fighting with guns, but also talking. Dude, it's during, like, I swear to God, like that moment with him and Loki when they're walking in the on the hallway, I was like, I'm watching fucking Flash it's Gordon. It's Flash Gordon, and it's only people who love Flash Gordon, the right. '80s movies, felt that. No one else yeah. had that. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. That's because you're not fucking cool enough to fucking love Flash Gordon. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to rank up people who hate Flash Gordon or don't love it the way we do. Right. But it's kind of fun when you have that simpatico moment because like I, I was like, you know, go gore would, you know, I thought of a bunch of different people that we've talked about Flash Gordon and why it's so great. Mm -hmm. 
It's like those moments. I half expected the lasers to be spirally. <laughs> right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and the music, did the music kind of feel a little Flash Gordon to you a little bit? Totally Mark cool Brothers Bob. Yeah, well, I mean, it's awesome. It's the fucking the king of Devo. It makes right. sense. And I liked, I liked the, the music. Some people didn't like the music. I thought the music fit perfectly. Me tone, too. You know? it's, 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 it fit this movie. And it you probably is not. that Zeppelin fucking song coming in twice. I mean. Oh my God, the Zeppelin wow. song. I got chills. I, yeah, I, I, I like chills. I was that, freaking the fuck out. Like, look, are we talking spoilers in this? Uh, we, we did talk spoilers because this get, podcast isn't right, going to come is, out through. This is my, Chris yeah. Gore's fucking film threat, right? So this spoilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's being spoil everything because no one gets to stop spoiling things. So no, like, spoil everything. Everything. spoil everything. Spoil. Well, no, I'm not. I'm, all I'm going to talk about is that opening Surter sequence. With right, the right, right. Song, and you you see Thor cut loose. Uh, I mean, this was cool where you actually got a chance to see the God of Thunder just killing it, like fighting demons and shit, and it's like going toe to toe with Surter with his sword. I mean, it's like two Led Zeppelin. How, it doesn't get fucking cooler than no, that. It, it, it just doesn't insane. get... Like, that's where I was like, I could walk out of this fucking movie right now, seven fucking minutes into the film, and I'm like, this is one of the greatest comic book adaptations <laughs> ever. I mean, it's like... And you did you already mention, like, sort of... I don't, I don't know how far spoilery we want to go. Yeah. Turn off the fucking podcast. Probably not the end. Probably not the All last right, no, third. I'm not gonna, but I'm not, I don't even want to spoil anymore, because it comes out in a week. But everyone's going to yeah. see it, so... Yeah. It's, it's coming out next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well then you guys m- must have seen it by now. So yeah. definitely, I was gonna say I loved the s- the opening sequence. Because oh my god! In the trailer, yeah, it's, it's like Thor is talking to us, like the audience. We're like, is that gonna be in the tra- Is that gonna be in the movie? And then you're like, oh shit! It's because he's talking to a skeleton. <laughs> right. And it makes total sense. He's bored. He's been trapped there for a couple of days. Whatever. I mean, it makes sense. And I, I, you know, I liked how they resolved Hoboden. They didn't have Hobo Odin in it because uh-huh. they're right, like, right, right. And Tyga's already been on record saying, "Look, we didn't want to have you know Odin with a bunch of cars honking in the background." And it makes sense now the where they are in the film. Right. Well, look, don't don't listen to the rest of this because yeah. now we're going to talk spoilers in that last third. So if you're listen, still listening, you haven't seen the movie, turn this the fuck off. Turn this off mm-hmm. or listen to it later. Okay. Thor loses an eye. Right. I, did you? You were in Hall H. Sure. At, okay. He had his eye. He at the beginning of Infinity in War. all the trailers, too. Right, in right. all the trailers. So they're going to digitally have to be popping that little uh, no, no, but wait. Odin fucking what, eye. So did they do that to trick people? Because yes. Anthony was talking about here. Well, they did that with uh, Thor 2, The Dark World, mm-hmm. where like they in the some of the first footage they released, he gets his hand chopped off. Right. And I remember distinctly, like not in any of the TV spots, but in the footage they showed in Hall H, like they had scenes where he had his hand wrapped. And obviously, in the movie, like that's like an illusion. It doesn't actually right. happen. I, I love how Marvel does that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they went as far as they've actually spent money rendering out effects for these Thor Ragnarok trailers, where yeah. he's landing on the Rainbow Bridge with both of his eyes yeah. with electricity in it. And when you see the movie, it's only one eye because Hella fucking yeah, ate the other exactly. eye. And also, there are scenes like a lot of people are like, "Well, Loki doesn't have those the double knife scene." It's like, "All right, that's cool. That's in the trailer, but he doesn't do that in the movie." And there's also that scene where they're all on the Rainbow Bridge and Hell's walking towards them is not in the movie. There's never a scene where all four of them cuz Hulk's off fighting that fucking wolf. Yeah. So that shit doesn't happen either, but it's like it doesn't really matter cuz it's a trailer. It's like this is some shit that we're setting up. The epic quality of this is still in the movie, but it's all separate because all this other stuff is going on. So Yeah. I didn't feel bummed out. The only thing I was bummed out about is like not seeing Hella smash that hammer in the in the back alley somewhere. Yeah, was, what was that? Well, that's what we were talking about. They changed Hoboden, and so they changed Hella's entrance as well. Yeah, because Doctor Strange was like doing all this crazy magic, and he's like, "Here, it's just behind my house." You're like, "What the fuck?" So it makes more sense that he here go to Valhalla or whatever. Well, just, so. think of, just think of geographically, like how much they would have had to have done to to set that up. I think I think they were doing that just for economy of time and just. You know, compressing things, but okay, that ending, that set up, that's whose ship is that, dude? That's like some Cree fucking Cree scroll something or is it? That's what, what I it? think. It has to be, yeah. or, or, I mean, or it, is it Thanos? Like what? I mean, what is that ship? It's not Thanos. It's not I, I think it's like a, a scroll ship. That's my guess. It's gonna be there's some. It's gonna lead into some shit that happens in at the very top of Infinity War. Because that's why, like, Feige's talking about, like, Korg and me, Mikey are going to be back and all this other shit. And you're like, that's because it probably pops off right there, you know? 
Thor's no. floating in space because this fucking spaceship gets blown to bits. Where's yeah, Sif? Think, yeah, do you think that the Asgard ship gets blown up? I mean, no, maybe that's I, well, something some happens. Fight. Thor does something where he gets fucking taken off the off the ship. Meets Rocket Raccoon because we've already seen that in Infinity War. So. Right, right. Well, we saw in the preview, which we're going to see a trailer pretty soon. Yeah, you know, for Infinity I feel War. like they're going to drop Infinity War during Thor Ragnarok. You think so? Yeah. yeah, I'll check it out, I guess. I guess I'll see I'll it. I'll see it. I Why not? Yeah. Everyone's already talked about it. I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about how, like, the other thing we were talking about was how Marvel, just as a series of films, there's you could almost say there's a Marvel movie. Right. There's a type of Marvel movie is like a tone of the perfect mix of stuff that tugs at your heart, stuff that, like, oh, I can't wait. Stuff that's a, the other thing that, like, the Marvel movies have been doing so well is stuff we've never seen in a movie. Oh, yeah. Whereas I think so many other franchises just sort of go back to, like, I guess you want aliens coming out of people's stomachs, Man, so we'll I do just, that again. Uh, my fear for Justice League is they're all going to be, like, going towards something with garbage in the sky with a hole in the... We must right. close the hole to n- apocalypse. Like, don't do that. It's just, yeah, don't it's going to be, that. Yeah. that was the ending of Avengers. I could see, like, executives from Warner Brothers, like, use the Avengers as the animatic for Justice League. I, they better not do that. I think they kind of poked fun at the giant portal in the sky in Thor Ragnarok. With the yes, they did. The yeah, anus. The devil's anus. It was yeah. literally the devil's anus. And, yeah, it was. Devil's anus. It was, uh, I'm seriously, I was like, because Suicide Squad already did that with the, the Enchantress. I'm like, look, how many more movies? Uh, Avengers Age of Ultron had literally, like, a thousand robots. It's like, how you must fight all these gnat-like creatures, which mean nothing. It's like, like, every single one of the Transformers movies did that, too. Yes, yeah, so I... I'm hoping that I, I already know that that's probably has to be one of the resolutions, but hopefully that's act two. And that's when Superman comes back from the dead and then they fucking slap him awake. And then there's some other situation that we have not seen in the trailers, which I know this isn't true because movies never do this kind of cool shit where, yeah, we never saw the third part where it's like they actually go to apocalypse and dark sides in it. What? Wouldn't that fuck everybody up if that actually did happen? But and that's what they were doing all these secret reshoots for. We're like, we're not going to end it with this. The three mother boxes being converging into one light source to open up a portal to Apocalypse. Yawn. I'm fucking bored. I swear to God, please don't do that. That's all. I, it's not too late. Well, the movie's already done. So we, I have no idea if they're doing that. We were just saying, like, the way I felt when Batman v Superman came out was like, let's get this over with. Oh, like, because there was so much over. They overmarketed it in this. They've kind of overmarketed it in a different way, where Superman's not part of the marketing, right. and they've done some really bizarre tie-ins with like, I don't know, AT and T or Verizon or whatever. Right. I, you know. So, but I gotta just, say, I'm very excited for the film. I love the new Flash. I no, no, love I think Wonder Woman. I think yeah. Aquaman. It's like he's getting a little too surfer bro for me. The more footage I keep seeing, but I'm still right. 100 in. Uh, I love Ben Affleck as Batman. I love Wonder Woman. But I, but I kind of begrudgingly bought tickets to the dome screening at 8 p.m. on huh. on uh, on that. It just so, are, are you, but you're going to see it before because yeah. you. Yeah. See, I'm not. I don't have a. I'm not. I'm on Warner Brothers shit list for a number of reasons. I'll do a whole podcast about that one day. Okay. Not really. It's not worth it. Uh, All right. Well. But uh, but whatever. So so yeah. So I'm just sort of. I'm I'm just cautiously I look I, I want it to be good but like everything I've seen in the trailer just looks like they shot the whole movie against a green screen well because they kind of did shoot the whole movie <laughs> right. against a green screen but you know what uh, you know I'm gonna my jury is out until I see the film like it's like it's easy that's to what I love about you with you're, you're you're like a, you just want to wait to see well, it me because I you know I'm going in with lowered expectations I'm not going in like it's gonna destroy it's gonna be so awesome but yeah man I feel like if they and you have Joss Whedon who's a, a fucking died in the wool nerd mm-hmm. he's a super sweaty it's like he did a great job with Avengers I think he did a great job with Age of Ultron with the, what he was given to, to work with and I mean he wrote it but I'm just saying like it's a lot of pressure. Like introduce yeah. these thirty characters and Ultron and do these set things up the next movie, set up the, yeah. the rest of the next phase eleven or whatever the fuck. So it's like I feel like he was given a film that Warner Brothers wasn't happy with. With Zack Snyder's film, they were like, "Look, we need you to fix this. We need you to we need you to rearrange this or do something with it that we weren't. We're, we're getting like Batman v Superman Part Two. We don't want that. We want something different." And he was able to add a bunch of dialogue and change a lot of scenes and I don't know if he was able to change it enough to make it different than what we're hoping it's not but yeah. I don't know what I don't even know what like I purposely don't know what the story is except from what they've 
told me via the trailers, there are these three mother boxes. That's, you know, uh, it's like Cyborg's one of them. I guess one's in uh, uh, Themyscira and one's in, in Atlantis. Atlantis. yeah. And there's a bunch of bug creatures, the parademons, who are going to be the faceless drones or robots or whatever. The, the things that don't matter that you... Fall, Storm it's, troopers. Storm troopers, yeah. you just kill them and things whatever. Things that you can rip apart. Yeah, things no that blood. get destroyed. Yeah. And it's uh, th that one had a family. No, it was <laughs> it was not. It was growing in this body bank. What? Uh, whatever. So you kill a thousand of them. So, you know... And I'm, then mother boxes. They're not alive. Who the hell knows? I'm cautiously optimistic about Justice League. I, I want it to be good. Like, I, I, I love competition. I, I love the competition between DC Dude, and, and, and Marvel. Dude, if Justice League is half as good as I want it to be, I'll be over the moon. Like, exactly. if they have that yeah. shot where all six of them are like, and I don't want it to end with them. Like, no. like, I don't want Superman to just show up and then it ends. I want to see Superman kicking some ass. If he fights Darkseid, I'll cry like oh a my God, I'll yeah. fall into a fetal position. And they know, they know like half the adults, mostly men in their 30s and 40s, are going to be like, if we did this one thing, that demographic will cry and become babies. <laughs> like, it's like, that's not asking a lot for all of the people who are like, we'll spend $40 on IMAX and probably buy it on Blu-ray if you did these three things. Yeah. They should have a checklist and be like, did we do these three things that we know every single dyed-in-the-wool DC fan wants to see? And they'll be like, yes, yes, no. Well, then the third thing you've got to do. That's not a lot to ask, to do the three things. Yeah, not you know? as like a deleted scene, not no. as a, a special feature or one right. shot. Like, put it in the fucking movie. All right, I got to get back to my booth. It was All good right. talking. Good to yeah. see you. Thank Chris. you, John. Good to see you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, well, I think that sort of he he said it all. Yeah. He said it all. That was great. It was great to have John uh, pop in with that. I, and we Love did. John. Okay. Well, uh, I think you can tell from these clips. Um, there's a uh, John oozes enthusiasm for nerddom. Yeah. And that and um, that enthusiasm, that creative spark and energy. Um, is to, um, I mean, he, he may not be here, but that's but that spirit it will live on with all of his projects. And um, I do encourage you to see the death of Superman lives. What happened? Um, it's it's a fantastic documentary. Check out his um, Twitter at John Schnepp, and you'll see the GoFundMe is there, uh, and you can you can contribute, uh, which I know which I know will help Holly. And um, if you can't contribute at least spread the word put it out there retweet it post it on your facebook do what you can because yeah. that helps a lot too um did i ever tell you the first time i i met schnepp no now would be a good time we're doing yeah. a tribute to him why don't you tell me um so i met him um on a panel he did um and he was talking about working on metalocalypse and i was a big fan and you know me i'm, I'm kind of quiet and awkward you know until i get to know you I'm, I'm kind of a well people would say a weirdo or you get to do a hundred episodes of the podcast because <laughs> we're coming up on a hundred episodes now so it's yeah kind of crazy but even even now I'm, I'm kind of awkward and i'm, I'm very self-conscious about it and um he he was up there and basically you know talking about how you know his career his entire career started um, when he realized that he just needed to put himself out there, he needed to be bolder. He needed to, you know, um, be, I, I guess what's a better word for it? Brave. Um, and I'm watching this and at the end of it, he's just like, you know, now we're going to do a giveaway for a, uh, uh, I can't remember what season it is. I still have it, but a, a Blu-ray copy of, um, of Metalocalypse, one of the seasons of Metalocalypse and it was signed by, you know, him and, and, and Brendan Small and and some other people, I'm sure. And he was just like, "All right, we're going to do some Metalocalypse trivia." And he asked a question; nobody knew it, and I knew it, but I was too kind of shy to say anything. What I know. And uh, he was just like, "All right, no takers." And he asked another one, and I didn't know this question, and still the crowd was silent. But I was just like, "You know what? I'm just going to scream this out." I love Murder Face, who's my favorite character in, in Metalocalypse. And he was like, you know what? This goes to that guy over there. Come up here. <laughs> so I came up and I'm just like, you know, like scared. I'm shaking. Like, you know, I'm just so nervous. And I walk up and he hands me <laughs> the DVD. And like just the his words were kind of running through my head. And I was, you know, trying to give myself a pep talk. And I was just like, no, you promised me the Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed and he gave me the blu-ray and afterwards he was very generous and i just I, I felt kind of empowered and i felt like you know 
I, I did what you told me to do and I got something out of it. You know, if I put, if you put yourself out there, if you make yourself vocal, if you, you know, kind of give yourself courage, um, you get stuff, you know? And yeah, like some, it's so funny because he told, you know, like, because I forget that, like, John is in that Morgan Spurlock movie. Mm-hmm. Like, he's, like, right in the beginning, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, that com- the documentary that uh, Morgan did about Comic-Con. And John's in it. That's how John, that's when John realized, like, oh, I should be a personality. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting that you say that because he and I had have had that discussion. He just got sick of, I think he really got sick of partnering with people who kind of just, like, took his creativity and then did did their thing with it. They were better at promoting themselves. They were better at promoting yeah. themselves. Mm-hmm. And he was like, fuck this. It's so weird because this is also a thing that John kind of taught me. Like, in, in a weird way, John kind of taught me that like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, you shouldn't wait to express your feelings about someone if you care about them. You should say how you feel. And I kind of feel like if you want to, tell someone how you feel and how you feel is you want to tell them to fuck off. (laughs) You should tell them to fuck off and not hold back. And John, something in John snapped because I'd known him for years before that. And he was this kind of meek, nerdy, creative guy, did a lot of creative things, but he was always like, he always had some sad story about how he got screwed over by somebody. And then something snapped and he was like, not going to allow that to happen to him again yeah and that's when everything blew up that's when he did the death of superman lives that's when he started doing all these other shows that's when he started doing collider heroes he was like i'll just i'll be the i had no one's gonna rep me better than me i'll promote me so yeah it's funny that you I mean, say that that's that, basically what he was saying during this panel yes. it, it, it sucked me and you know i did vocalize what i wanted you know i did say you know something instead of just sitting there and being quiet you know, that, that Blu-ray went to me, and I will right. always cherish it. You know, uh, before this happened, I would still look at it, and I'd just be like, oh, yeah, that's the first time I met Schnapp. But I can tell you why he gave it to you. It's because he was you. Mm-hmm. Because he'd gone to plenty of panels and been the, been the person that sat in the chair and was was too awkward or nervous or scared to raise their hand and give an answer to a question that they knew the answer to. Yeah. So like I so knowing John all these years and just seeing him like and I'm not saying he was shy, but he definitely didn't stand up for himself, I think. And I think that there was something snapped and then that's when he became he became he he went full schnep. Yeah. And and I I, I don't know. I just uh I'm just happy that I got to be his friend for as long as I have and uh, share so many great times with him. So um, we're going to end this podcast uh, with just a moment of silence. And um, we thank you for listening. The Death of Superman Lives, what happened? You're going to find out. Kevin Smith's going to help tell it. I got involved. That's what happened. And then it died. It was truly the death of Superman.